Hi, I'm Babak, an uh, anesthetist from SMEMU Tehran, Iran, and I'm going to talk about intubation, extubation, and recovery for basic trainees who are first year and second year of residency. Regarding the intubation and securing the airway, why we should do that and when we are going to do that, who is going to do that and how we are going to, is, are the main features that we are going to discuss right now. There are several reasons that we are aiming to protect the airway. Firstly, we are looking at the main reasons that why the airway has problems that we are going to intubate, such as protecting the airway against a collapse, such as when we use muscle relaxants or the patient is unable to maintain a laryngeal muscle tone or we want to protect the lung from aspiration such as in rapid sequence induction for those who are not completely fasted or unconscious protecting integrity of the airway in trauma cases or when there is a stenosis or obstruction in the airway as well as when there are a lot of secretions in the airway and we want to do bronchial toilet the other reason that we intubate the patient or secure the airway for the patient is when the ventilation is not sufficient to have a good respiratory function. Therefore, we have to support the patient with uh, artificial ventilation and positive pressure ventilation. In that case, we have to secure the airway and put in the tracheal tube to be able to uh, give a positive pressure ventilation. We have already discussed the reasons that we secure the airway for the patients either by endotracheal tubes or proclotic devices or through mm, tracheostomy. Here we set goals at which time we have to start protecting the airway. Using muscle relaxant is one of the indications that we usually use endotracheal tube or when there is high risk of aspiration we use rapid sequence induction and we put endotracheal tube in place. In traumatic transection of tracheal larynx uh, for uh, securing the airway integrity, we have to put an ETT and in patients with a lot of secretions in order to excrete those secretions and suctioning them, we have to put an ETT. In hypoxemia, hypercarbia, and respiratory distress, we also use endotracheal tube intubation and provide the positive pressure ventilation to the patient. So who is eligible to do the intubation? Uh, it really depends on the patient situation as well as the expertise of the intubating person. In the basic trainees can uh, do the intubation for simple cases who is estimated to have easy airway man management and intubation. In adults who have good physiologic reserves such as ASA 1 or 2 and those with potential difficult airways, kids or ASA 3 and 4 with poor physiologic reserves should be intubated just by advanced trainees or experts. Now we have reached the point that we want to intubate the patient, how we should do that. We should prepare everything before starting the intubation and then we should plan for it and then performing the intubation for preparation. We should have a good IV access for the patient with a running fluid, airway devices such as intubating devices as well as supraglottic airway and uh, facial masks should be ready for the patient. Suction should be working and emergency backups such as ambul bag should be available. Access to the help and knowing where is the buzzer and also the team dynamics should have been done such as knowing who uh, who is around and uh, knowing the persons in detail and with names and also knowing what they can do in case of crisis. For planning, I usually use the Vortex guideline. In a few slides, we will reach there to find out what Vortex guideline is. 
but uh, I would say that the plan should be A, B, C, and D intubation, LMA, or supraglutic devices, and then face mask, and finally the surgical plan. So we should discuss all these steps with the other members in the team, and then we start the intubation plan allocating the roles for instance who is going to give the tube who is going to give the bougie and who is going to give the uh, cricoid pressure in case of rapid sequence induction and then we start with plan a which is intubation and if we fail with plan a we declare plan b and then we ask for the supraglottic devices and we should always avoid fixation error which is when we do something for the patients, for example, when we start with a lifeline such as intubation and we fail for the first time, then we have to step back and look at the patient and the situation again and then rethink about what is the problem and troubleshoot the, tro the problem, do a lot of diverse strategies to uh, facilitate the intubation for the second time and then retry for the intubation. This is the emergency airway cognitive tool for Vortex. We should have one of these cognitive tools in each operating theatre. It doesn't matter whether it is from uh, United Kingdom system, which is difficult airway society or death society algorithm, or the American Society of Anesthetists uh, algorithms. But um, in the Vortex um, cognitive tool, we can see that we have three main lifelines allocated as ABC, which is intubation, supraglottic airway, and face mask. And finally, the D plan would be the cannot intubate, cannot oxygenate, which is the surgical plan for the difficult airway situation. And uh, in this algorithm or in this diagram, you can see that we can interchange between each of these lifelines and uh, where, whichever is um, uh, successful and it would be really good because uh, we are maintaining the airway for the patient and we come from the blue zone which is the danger zone to the green zone which is the safe zone and uh, we can save the patient uh, the only thing is that um, we can attempt three times with the tube and fourth time in the case we have some expert available around and for each attempt, we should consider the maneuvers and uh, manipulations noticed on the right bar of this cognitive tool, which include manipulations such as head and neck maneuvers or burp maneuver for visualizing the vo vocal cords, or um, using adjuncts and um, changing the tube or suctioning the uh, area we are working at, or using the muscle relaxants. These are all the things that should be done after the first attempt of the tube and after each attempt we should step back, look what was the problem and troubleshoot and change the situation and then go further with another attempt or change the lifeline to another device such as LMA or face mask. It is a slide, you can see the plan A, B and C, which are the lifelines A, lifeline B and lifeline C. As we discussed, lifeline A is the intubation because we usually start with the intubation process first and that's why they call it plan A. So when we want to intubate a patient, the plan A would be intubation, plan B would be supraglottic device and plan C is the face mask maintaining the airway. For plan A, we have a lot of instruments and we should be aware of a lot of things here, as mentioned. For example, having different blades, different uh, laryngoscopes, such as video laryngoscope as well, and also um, endotracheal tubes, different sizes and different types uh, would be good to have around, as well as having the stylets and bougie, Eshman bougie or blue bougie, as well as McGill and lubricants. For plan B, which is supraglottic device, and we should have different size and different types of supraglottic devices, such as the IGL or the classic LMA or intubating LMA, as well as having some gel for uh, lubricating the LMA uh, to facilitate its insertion. 
And for, and for Plan C, we should have different size face masks as well as Goodall airway and nasopharyngeal airway as well. As you can see here, you are visiting a photo from a difficult airway trolley. Difficult airway trolley has uh, different drawers, but usually it has four based on the plans that we are discussing or we are having to do. For example, plan A is the intubation, so all the devices related to intubation is in the first drawer. And uh, for supraglottic devices, the second drawer. For face mask and uh, nasal airways, uh, drawers three. And the last drawer, which is the uh, bottom drawer, is the surgical devices. And uh, we usually get there uh, when the, it, it is a very difficult situation. So, for instance, in the first drawer, you have different uh, blade size and different blade types, as well as uh, video laryngoscopy. And uh, in addition to these, you should have different uh, tube sizes as well available for intubating the patient. Here is a sample of checklist that we should have before intubating the patient. We should know each other in the team and we should know the, the team dynamics and we should know how to communicate with each other. We should know our skills and our levels. Uh, regarding the patient, we should have the monitors on and we should have the observations. We should know uh, the past medical history of the patient and we should have done the physical examination of the patient and we should know why we are going to interpret the patient. And uh, regarding the drugs, we should check the drugs before intubating the patient and the fluid should be running as well as for rapid sequence induction drugs should be chosen and rescue drugs should be available such as vasopressors and shagamadex and uh, post intubation sedation plan should be uh, well set and the equipments should also be checked such as suction working in the back uh, or ambu bag in total should be connected and good old nasal airways should be available. So there is a checklist and uh, we can, uh, for each patient, we should check uh, these um, boxes to see if everything has been done and we are in the safe zone to do the intubation for the patient. For laryngoscopy, you should have a landmark. My landmark is the tip of the um, epiglottis. And uh, when the tip of the laryngoscope is within the valecula, which is anterior part of the epiglot uh, cartilage, then you will be able to see the epiglottis. And then by holding the handle of the laryngoscope toward uh, the feet of the patient, and a bit upward, I mean away anterior part to the patient, uh, then you will be able to see the posterior to the epiglottis, which is the vocal cords. And uh, based on the view that you have, if you can see the vocal cords, posterior commissioner, and also the anterior part, it is called MacLehan 1. And if you cannot see anything at the back of the uh, tongue, and even if you cannot see the, uh, any part of the epiglottis, it is called MacLehan um, 4, which, is, which indicates that it is a very difficult case for intubation. Regarding the extubation of the endotracheal tube or removal of the supraglottic airway device, uh, why and when we are doing the extubation, who should do that and how we should do that are the topics that we are going to discuss right now. So for extubation, why do we extubate the patient? We are expecting the patient to be able to return to normal breathing and be discharged uh, without any tube. And when do we do the extubation or removal of the LMA? Uh, when we are assured that uh, there is uh, no problem with the airway and uh, there is no need for securing the airway or the, for instance the tracheostomy is in place in case that it is needed to have a prolonged secured airway we are able to extubate a patient uh, 
and who should do the extubation in many cases when it is simple um, residents or uh, non-experts can do the extubation when the criteria is sufficient to be assured that uh, the patient is able to uh, maintain the airway but uh, when there is a difficulty or when we assume that there might be difficulties in extubation, we should let uh, experts do that extubation. How we do the extubation? In kids, there are some exceptions. In my practice, I usually extubate the ETT when, depend, when the kid is completely light uh, regarding the anesthesia, uh, or I remove the supraglottic devices in kids when the patient is still in the deep levels of uh, anesthesia and uh, for the difficult airways or those who I expect that I might have difficulty in extubation for instance in the surgeries on the neck or when I expect some edema around the larynx which makes the uh, post extubation breathing a bit difficult for the patient uh, then I will follow the DAS guideline uh, for extubation of difficult cases. This slide shows the DAS extubation guideline for difficult extubation scenarios. It has four steps. At first step, we have to plan whether the patient is going to have a difficult extubation scenario. And the step two is preparation. We should optimize the patient regarding cardiovascular, respiratory and neuromuscular situation. And also, we should prepare everything, including the drugs, equipments, and also be aware that uh, where is the help and how we can access the help. At a step three, we have the key question, is it safe to remove the tube right now or not? If we are going to extubate the patient right now, we can extubate the patient when the patient is fully awake, or we can put some device in place in case re-intubation is needed. And if we are not safe to do the extubation right now because of several reasons, such as edema around the larynx, we can do that later in the intensive care unit. So the patient should stay intubated for several days till the edema subsides. And then in a safer environment, we can extubate the patient. And after the extubation, we should decide whether the patient is um, safe to go to recovery and to be discharged the same day or should stay for the night and go to the ICU or HDU units. In the recovery room, major complications are leading causes of mortality and morbidity or uh, post-operative nausea and vomiting, hypoxemia, which is usually due to VQ mismatch, but it can be due to airway problems such as the collapse of the airway or bradynia due to opioid overdose and also the problem with the bleeding which should be sought very quickly and treated accordingly. Regarding the management of uh, hypoxemia in recovery as any emergency case we should consider the ABC approach for the A or airway management, we should stimulate the patient, shake the patient, and uh, do the simple airway management maneuvers such as jaw thrust and head tilt. And if it is necessary, then decide to intubate the patient. For the breathing, just to stimulate the patient and ask the patient to take deep breath. If it is not possible, then uh, you should think for uh, providing back mask ventilation and putting the ATT in and uh, providing positive pressure ventilation. For the circulation, make sure that the patient has an IV access, the fluid is running, and in case of uh, hypotension or bradycardia, then you can use vasopressor or atropine. Regarding the drugs, you should check what was given to the patient recently and uh, make sure that the uh, plane of uh, anesthesia, which was maintained by the muscle relaxants or the hypnotics or the opioids level, has decreased sufficiently for the patient to become conscious. If you are afraid and you're um, worried about the opioids, then you can use naloxone and then you should do the biochemistry and ABG to make sure that there is no other problems underlying there. And uh, you should not forget to think systematically regarding the etiology of the hypoxemia. My approach is from wall to cell approach. Um, from wall to cell means that uh, I will check the um, oxygen source 
also if the oxygen is connected to the patient and there is no disconnection of the tubes and then make sure the airway is patent and also uh, think about the potential causes in the trachea and bronchi such as clots or bronchospasm in case of asthma also i will think about the lung parenchyma such as um, edema or uh, hemorrhages and also extra parenchymal such as pneumothorax or hemothoraxes and um, finally i will think about the uh, chest cage and to see if there is any remnant part of the muscle relaxants which causes the chest wall to be rigid and not being flexible for ventilation and then i will check for the cardiovascular system and uh, hemoglobin and car oxygen carrying capacity and uh, then I will fix uh, the problem accordingly.